Merci d'être ici. Alors, les séminaires généraux aujourd'hui touchent les thèmes de la ionosphère et nous avons beaucoup de chance parce que à l'IPG, nous avons une espère au niveau mondial sur les sujets. Donc, heureusement, Elvira Astafieva a accepté de faire un séminaire. Donc, Elvira a fait ses études en Russie. Donc, en 2005, elle a obtenu un PhD. Et ensuite, elle a enchaîné avec des postdocs, notamment au Japon et à l'IPG, ici en France. Et c'est ainsi qu'en 2012, elle a été embauchée par les CNRS. Et pratiquement presque la même année, elle a aussi décroché un ERC qui a duré quelques années. Et en 2016, elle a obtenu la médaille de bronze du CNRS. Alors, Elvira s'intéresse à la ionosphère et notamment à la réponse de la ionosphère, par exemple au tremblement de terre, au tsunami, à l'activité volcanique, ou bien la réponse de la ionosphère aux orages magnétiques. Donc, je pense de laisser la parole à Elvira. Donc, ionosphere connecting natural hazards and space sciences. So, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for the Yes, I'm doing it in English for our colleagues, non francophone. Yeah, so, um, uh, yes, uh, my presentation today will be about the ionosphere. This is a part of the atmosphere that is electrically charged. And indeed, it does connect natural hazards and space sciences, as the title says. And um, so here is the scheme showing how the ionosphere is actually um, behaves as a natural detector of numerous geophysical events uh, from coming from above, such as uh, solar activity flares, eclipses, geomagnetic storms, also the thermosphere, which is ac actually upper neutral atmosphere that has a drastic effect on ionospheric behavior. But also at the same time, there is an impact from below, natural hazards, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcano eruptions. Those are natural hazards that are now proved to have a response in the ionosphere. In addition to that, the ionosphere also um, can help us to detect man-made events, such as rocket launches or explosions. So I'll start from the beginning, saying that the ionosphere is created by the sun. The ionization, the uh, emissions in the UV, the extreme ultraviolet uh, band, but also primarily, but also the X-rays, this is a ionizing uh, emission. It takes away electrons from atoms and molecules and creates atoms. This is how the ionosphere is formed. So the, if we take a look on the altitudinal range, it will extend from 60 kilometers. This is the lower boundary that almost uh, does not change. However, the upper boundary is eight to thousand kilometers. This changes depending on the solar conditions. Then one of the main parameters of the ionos ionosphere is the electron density. And the maximum of this electrons, the location of these electrons will fall between 250 and 400 kilometers of altitude. So you see this parameter is very drastically, and this is one of the main features of the ionosphere. It is very, very variable medium. For instance, I can show you an example of day and night um, profiles of plasma density. So this is the plasma density and altitude, and you see that there is a drastic variation between day and night condition. Add here day-to-day -day variability, because the ionosphere will change from day to day, then depending on season, on latitudes, even um, the physics of the ionospheric behavior at low latitudes and high latitudes will be absolutely different. So this all complicates the things. However, the most uh, significant uh, impacts are coming from the sun and solar activity, from changes in the magnetic field and also in the thermosphere. And uh, so it's, as you can understand, this is, this uh, complicates things a lot. And this is why uh, nowadays, it's uh, more than a century after the discovery of the ionosphere, we're still not able to predict the states of the ionosphere. Here I can show you an example of, so this is on the left, our observations, and on the right 
is the rep re rep um, reproduction of the TC of the ionospheric parameter by one of the most advanced models. This is a physics-based first principles model, and yet we can see significant discrepancies between observations and modeling. So some of you may ask, why do we need this? Why do we need to know the state of the ionosphere at some particular place in some time? So of course, it's a fundamental aspect. However, there is also an applicational aspect. Ionosphere is a very major player in the space weather sciences because this is a medium of propagation of radio waves. Depending on the frequency, the waves will be either reflected or will propagate through it. And so if in the ionosphere, by, a, by some chance, there are curious steep gradients of electron density or some irregularities, which means that at some point uh, the density is much stronger than around, we will lose the communication. The signal will be lost, the scintillation will occur, the communication simply will be lost. So the thing is, nowadays we are depending more and more on the communications, and not only the militaries, but also the civils. Uh, one of the example, examples that I would like to show here today is the ionospheric intrusion, basically, in the military operation Anaconda in Afghanistan in 2002. What happened there is there were two military groups that Team number one that was trapped, and team number two was sent to rescue team number, team number two. Team number one. So team number two, they sent the message, do not land on the peak because it was under the enemy control. But this message was never received. So this ionospheric intrusion led to casualties in the American army. And uh, raised many questions on what happened among the military authorities in the US. Until a decade later when researchers in the John Hopkins University discovered by chance that right during the time of this operation and the place, there occurred a huge plasma bubble that disrupted the communication. So what is the plasma bubble is simply a region which is usually um, located along magnetic field lines, like banana-shaped. And inside, the density is very low. But on the boundaries, density is very high. So signals simply cannot propagate in such conditions. So the problem now is that we still we are not quite able to predict such things. And uh, we only need, know the probability of when this might occur, but yet uh, more studies needed to work on this. So next, uh, before I proceed to my personal connections to the ionosphere, I would like to just uh, in two words show how we work on the methodology. So I personally and also the space science community, we use very often the global navigation satellite systems such as GPS, GLONASS, etc. And to extract the ionospheric part, we need the dual frequency receivers. And we use both ground-based and also space-borne. So the, when a receiver is placed on the low Earth orbit satellite. So from, dual, uh, from these uh, frequencies, from the signal sent on two frequencies, we can estimate from phase and code measurements, we estimate the total electron content which is an atmospheric parameter which is equal to number of electrons between a satellite and a receiver. And then, taking an approximation of a thin layer at located at the maximum of ionization, we calculate the sub-ionospheric points so that we can not only know that the perturbation occurred, but also can localize it in a space. So, uh, now, uh, the first part of my presentation will be on the impact from the above. And um, I would like first uh, to tell you about the, the most drastic influence on the ionosphere, which comes from the sun. So you see here on this image these dark spots. These, they are called sunspots. And this is the most trouble 
region for us. Because sun flares, uh, solar flares, but also coronal mass ejection that provoke magnetic storms, they will come from here. So such sunspots, they occur and disappear constantly on the sun's surface. And there are times where we can observe many spots, and there are times we can observe very few spots. Because the sun lives by its own cold solar cycle, that is 11-year cycle, which means that every 11 years it will, the solar activity will reach its maximum and then it will decline. Like shown here, so you see the number of sunspots versus years, and you see that every 11 years we see the maximum, which is called maximum solar activity, then it goes down, this is the minimum solar activity, etc. So all the emissions coming from sun, they will also follow this 11-year cycle. And consequently, what we can understand is that it, the ionosphere will also repeat this 11-year cycle. Every, in the minimum of the cycle, every 11 years, we will, show, we will have less density in the ionosphere, and the ionosphere will be more dense, more rich, every 11 years again. So just for the information, right now we are here, we are at the very beginning of the cycle number 25, so they are numbered since the first discovery of this cycle uh, variations. So now going straight to the research. So first is uh, about the solar flares and their impacts on the ionosphere. So as you may see here, the solar flare was caught by uh, several instruments. So solar flare is a sudden emission from the sun. So it might or not be accompanied by a burst also of a matter, of solar matter from, from these spots, from the sun spots. So the emission usually comes in eight minutes because it's electromagnetic uh, nature. Uh, the spectrum of emission can be very different, but mostly we use, we, we see very often the UV and the X-ray, and sometimes we also see a huge increase in the radio band. This is very dangerous for the radio communication because to, when the re solar radio bursts occur, the, com the communication is lost, especially for the high frequency uh, band. So here I would like to show you an example of solar flares that occurred in September of 2017. It was uh, one of the largest solar flares in the last solar cycle. And you can see here the UV and the X-ray, so both bands were uh, concerned during the solar flare. And the first flare is slightly less intense than the second one. So if we think of it, what we can guess is that the reaction in the ionosphere will be sudden increase in the density. And this is actually what occurs indeed. So the reaction of the ionosphere to the first flare is shown on the first row. So here is before the flare, and then you see a sudden but somewhat small increase on the whole day side, right? So then we'll take a look on the second eruption. So before the flare, then the flare starts, and if if you could see on the previous image, the second flare lasted a little bit longer. So we can see stronger and longer response in the ionosphere. And then it all quietes. So it seems quite linear. However, we're still, there are still several open scientific questions about the uh, response of the ionosphere to solar flares, especially what is difficult is if we want to predict if we have a flare of this intensity, how many TC units will, will it produce in the, uh, in the ionosphere? This is yet difficult. And the, uh, why it is complicated is because the ionosphere is coupled to thermosphere, which is also affected by solar flare. And then there is also the electrodynamical changes due to the solar flares. So things are yet to study. So the next example will be the eclipse. So what happens if the moon suddenly stands between the sun and the earth? Why if it closes the sun? So I would like to show this an example of the great American eclipse that occurred in August 2017. This is a work done by uh, our colleagues, including a PhD student who is now a doctor, Eisenweiss. And um, so this is the most documented solar eclipse in the history because it was well, it was expected and it occurred over the territory of the USA, 
where there were many campaigns, measurements. And uh, so you will see the moon shadow will start from here. And of course, it produces the depletion, but not only just, above, just below the, its shadow, but it's rather extended. I'll just show here again. So extended area and also some ball waves were observed right here, which is also something that is yet difficult to explain. So next, this is the geomagnetic storms and the ionosphere, and this is a very complex subject as compared to the previous two that I have shown. I'm coming back to this image because geomagnetic storms that are actually perturbation in the magnetic field, they are generated on the sun. When the coronal mass ejections are coming out from the sun, and unlike the emissions of electromagnetic uh, nature, the coronal mass ejection, this is a solar uh, matter, solar uh, plasma that is magnetized. So it propagates along the magnetic field lines and it travels usually from one to three days, depending on their velocities. And when it arrives to Earth, the, the most important parameter will be the southeast the, um, the south-north component, this is a busy component of the interplanetary magnetic field. Because this, is, this direction will be the opposite to the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, and it will set up the reconnection and will cause this, a series of events that, will, that have a common name of geomagnetic storm. So this is a whole list of what usually happens in the ionosphere when this uh, um, CME arrives. So we see the reconnection, we see the particles precipitation in the high latitudes, drill heating in the auroral regions, and we see the auroras. Then we see the changes in the current systems because the interplanetary magnetic field penetrates in the Earth's magnetosphere. And then it is, it is immediately transferred to low latitudes and this all lead to significant changes in current systems and also the thermosphere is very much impacted by the storms because it's getting heated, it expands, and the whole circulation of the thermosphere changes during the storm. There are winds, we call these winds, the circulation, they, the storm time winds that can be strong and all this will have a very significant impact on the ionosphere. We will observe increases and decreases, and it will not be global, but you will see it's very different from what we see during solar flares and eclipses. So when we study the response of the ionosphere and thermosphere to geomagnetic storms, uh, the, for me the best approach is the multi-instrumental, is simply a combination of multiple instruments. In my practice I've used the ground-based like Genesis, magnetometers, ionosons, and, and space-borne instruments. And here is um, the uh, beauty of this uh, approach is because we can have it at the fortunate geometry of satellites, we can have a 3D information about the distribution of the ionosphere, and we also can have several parameters, and that this all will help us to understand what happens. Because um, geomagnetic storms are the most complex, uh, they cause the most complex effects in the ionosphere and they are the most difficult to predict. So geomagnetic storm of June 2015, this is one of uh, the works that I've done, I've done many works on, on this storm. So um, in the first panel there is a solar wind velocity and you can see that during these two days there arrived three so, uh, coronal mass ejections. As you can see, this is step-like changes in the solar wind. So then the, this is the changes in the interplanetary magnetic field. So it, first it was quiet, nearly. Then there are some fluctuations. And then with the arrival of the third CME, so first the huge step-like change in the solar wind velocity occurred, but also um, this IMF 
change it quite drastically. And the last index, this is actually the, uh, this is called CMH. This is the index of disturbance that occurs on Earth. And you can see first here, with the arrival of the first CME, the magnetic field was compressed, then it quieted, then again compressed. But the storm actually started with the arrival of the last CME. So the storm is here when the CMH index starts to go down. Then it uh, actually, when it goes up again, it is called the recovery phase, but it yet it's still storm time. So now going to the results. So this is uh, this will be the global TC maps. This is, this is the TC. This is the TC changes as compared to the quiet time. So all storm time changes will be here. And here is to understand how the ionosphere changes with the parameters. So these are only two days. So this is the second CME that didn't really cause any significant changes. So you can see here. And then the ionosphere just leaves its own life, day-to-day -day variability. And then the storm starts. And this is where the troubles occur. As you can see, here is the increase, then you can see decrease, then another significant increase, here is decrease, and then the recovery phase starts. No, almost no changes, and if we look at this, the TEC, it goes nearly to zero levels. So this is a very common thing for the recovery phases of the storm when the ionosphere is very poor. So in summary, if what we observe from the GNSS will be here. So the first, we'll see the first positive phase is what we call when we observe a significant increase in the ionosphere as compared to the quiet time levels. So here is actually was the first time when we could see clearly the, um, the, uh, the effects caused by several different sources. So once spot is in the low latitudes, which is because of the changes in the electrodynamics in the equatorial region. But then you can see this spot, this was because of the particle precipitation and high latitudes effect, you can see here. So then this first positive phase was followed by a negative phase when it quieted for a while because of the electrodynamics changes. And then a second positive storm arrived this one. This one was actually very difficult to explain. So we made a special study on this uh, increase and we found out that this increase, this positive storm occurred because of pure thermospheric influence. There was no influence of the electrodynamics. So what happened is the storm time thermospheric winds that were enhanced already by, by the particle precipitation and the, uh, thermosphere heating they made the ionosphere move along the magnetic field lines, which is higher in altitudes, at that level where the recombination is low. So this led to the increase, the overall increase of the TEC in this region. So then uh, another thing that we observe is the, the depletion, like decrease of the, ionos of the TEC as compared to the background values. And this is where the recovery phase started. So this was the ground-based observations. Uh, we can observe, we can also take a look on the satellites. And here I would like to show the TEC changes. This is the reference TEC, I mean the TEC changes with respect to the quiet time reference line. And this is the in situ electron density measurements from Swarm C. So here the time goes from right to left, that way. So 21st of June is here, then 22nd and 23rd. So what we see here is first, nothing happens until the storm, like we observe in the GNSS and ground-based. So then we see the first positive phase that is followed by quiet time. Then the second positive phase also seen in both uh, TEC and electron density. And this was a very good luck to have these observations right above the Asian region where we observe already the positive storm. And uh, then it all becomes quiet. So, and then talking about the uh, modeling, we also made uh, 
this comparison by the same semi-3 model, which is a very advanced model. And what we can see here is we're still a lot of discrepancies and lots of work has to be done in the modeling these effects. Especially this second positive phase is not reproduced at all by the model. And if, if we explain this by the thermospheric wind influence, this gives a direct indication that this model does not take into account the thermospheric winds very carefully. So then I can show, I would like to show the results from swarm B and C. This is the reaction of the thermosphere to the same storm. So the thermosphere is easier to understand. So here also you see the so time again runs from right to left, so nothing happened, nothing serious happened until the storm started here. So then, as uh, it is usually predicted by the models and uh, by the theory, the perturbation starts in the high latitude region, then it propagates toward the low latitudes, then again it increases and then it quietens. So, both day and night, both satellites at different altitudes and different uh, local regions, they show similar results. So uh, there I have my first part of conclusions for this part of, uh, of my talk. So that the method that I have been working on, this is the multi-instrumental approach, this is a very effective method, it uh, shows the 3D information about the ionospheric and also the thermospheric distribution and it also helps us to understand which was the driver, why this spot, at this spot we observe increase or decrease in the ionosphere. So the next step will be uh, try the high-resolution imagery, and I, by that I mean both spatial and temporal, because nowadays we have more and more new instruments that allow us to, to obtain high-resolution results, which can be important for some, for some phenomena, such as bub plasma bubbles, for instance. And of course, we have to continue with new observations because this will make this makes a significant contribution to model improvements and also for space weather forecasts. So next, we will go downstairs <laughs> to natural hazards, to impacts from below. And the first in a row will be earthquakes, tsunamis, and the ionosphere. So how this happens that we see signatures in the ionosphere? The ground displacements cause acoustic waves that propagate upward and reach the ionosphere in eight minutes. Then Rayleigh waves propagate and they also re uh, induce the acoustic waves. They also propagate upward and reach the ionosphere. Finally, the tsunamis propagate along the surface and generate gravity waves. Those waves that propagate obliquely, not vertically, and they reach the ionosphere in 45 to 60 minutes. So the theory predicts that a uh, ionospheric response to any piston-like motion, which is the displacement of the ground, is N-shaped. However, practice shows that in, for stronger earthquakes, we observe much more, more complex waveform. And uh, also the practice, and um, we have a lot of um, cases now, we have studied lots of cases with the development of the GNSS. So now it, what is known is uh, earth, earthquakes with magnitudes more than 6.87, they are very likely, very much likely to cause perturbations in the ionosphere. And this is independently on the focal mechanism. So even strike slip earthquakes that are the earthquakes that are characterized by uh, horizontal movement, they also cause the perturbations in the atmosphere. Why, we don't know yet, so it's a um, subject of the next study. So what is important here is that the amplitude of this initial increase of the um, uh, uh, ionospheric, uh, of the, in the ionosphere of the perturbation, it scales with the magnitude and with the uplift of earthquake, occurred during the earthquake. So this is a very old paper of mine that showed this law. 
But this result, they were com confirmed by several other research groups in the community later on more cases. And um, this result actually gives us a promise that probably one day we'll be able to understand from measurements and ionosphere, we will be able to understand the, um, the magnitude of an earthquake, the strength of an earthquake. So next I would like to show some results on the Tohoku earthquake so that produced a significant tsunami as we all know. So this is a, one of the GPS receivers in Sendai region who survived the tsunami, as you can see. So the Tohoku earthquake occurred in March 2011, the magnitude of 9, and in Japan there is a network of GPS receivers, now they are GNSS by the way. So, uh, yes, more than 1,200 receivers, and during the time of earthquake, mo most of the receivers captured 10 GPS satellites. So, if we look, this is an example of the TSC response to the Tohoku earthquake, just by one satellite, by several stations. You can see no changes, then the earthquake, and then several minutes later, you can see very drastic signatures. Well, it's it's far from N wave, right? It's it's very very complex wave shape because of uh, because it was a very large earthquake. So then, uh, because we have many satellites, many satellites and many receivers, we obtain about twelve thousand observation points. Each observation point is basically the, um, the line of sight between a receiver and a satellite at the altitude of the ionosphere. So for each point, we will have the time when we observe, we have longitude, latitude, and we have the TSC. So then, this is what we have. We'll have the map. Yes, this is the time running. So you can see each point is observational point between satellite and receivers, and you can have, you see several satellites, and the earthquake occurs at 5.46, right here, and you will see in about 7 to 8 minutes, the huge perturbation start to come from here. Different types of perturbations can be seen here. One went that way, and there were many circular perturbations, and all this continued until 8 o'clock, actually, I'm here, I stop at 6.40. So these were our observations, but then the question was raised, if we have these, observa these perturbations that we can detect rather early, it's about 8 minutes after an earthquake, if we can use them for some other purposes, I mean, whether we can un understand the seismic information from this. And this is one of the examples, because if we take a closer look on this um, TC distribution uh, shortly after the earthquake, which is 510 seconds after the earthquake, we will see two spots of TC increase. And knowing that the perturbation comes first vertically from the source, our interpretation is that during this earthquake there were two areas, at least two areas, of strong uplift. And this apparently was rather true, because this is what we see from the... Uh, this is an advanced model because they used records from seismometers and also the tsunami records and GPS, and so it's a multi-instrumental approach. So this was... Uh, a good result, result from our group. And this was a big potential of the ionospheric seismology because um, we can, in uh, only eight, nine minutes, we should be able to produce this kind of information. However, I have to point out that this is not that much straightforward because there are several issues to clear up if we really want to go near real time, and this is what we want to do next, to indeed to develop these methods in your, that will be compatible with near real time, because up to now all our results were obtained for retros retrospectively for the past earthquakes, but there is a big potential. 
So another potential for coming from the ionosphere is for the imagery of tsunamis because tsunamis they can be also detected by using GDNSS, but also from the air glow by using the uh, air glow cameras. So this is the um, atmosphere part at the, around uh, 200, um, 250 kilometers, and this was the first ever detection of tsunami-driven gravity waves five hours after the Tohoku earthquake, as you can see here. So the arrival of these gravity waves corresponded to the arrival of the tsunami waves. So I will just show another picture from Giovanni. He says we have other examples now for detection of tsunami-driven gravity waves in the air glow. And uh, there is also a mission proposal in, at CNES that is called Ionoglow that uh, aims to build a camera that will uh, that will um, sound that will take images of the air glow from space because these are from ground-based air glow cameras. So I also have to note another result from our group, which is the first ever tsunami weight height. Tsunami wave height inversion from the ionosphere. This was approached based on the normal mode summation. It was made by a PhD student who is now also a doctor, Rakoto. And uh, so, as you can see here, there is a very good agreement and the observations and the inversion of. So, the observations are in, in black and the inversion is shown in red. So next, uh, I would like to go to proceed to the last uh, point of my presentation is how we see the eruptions in the ionosphere. So similarly to earthquakes, eruptions can produce acoustic and gravity waves. Well, I know it's more complex than that, but this is a schematic view. <laughs> so first, the shock wave can occur if the volcano the eruption didn't occur for a long time and it was plugged. And then with the rise of, uh, of the plume and with changes, sudden changes of pressure and density, the acoustic gravity waves will be generated. So um, I will focus here on the on our studies of eruptions of the Calbuco volcano in Chile in 2015 a work that we did with my PhD student. So there were two eruptions, seven hours apart. So one occurred on April 22nd and the other April 23rd. Both of them were rather intense of volcanic explosivity index four, subplinian eruptions, and both had a plume, ash plume, rising up to 15 kilometers of altitude. So interesting, enough, this uh, eruption was caught by the Suomi satellite, again air glow measurements, so, but this is lower, this is the mesosphere, and you can see the concentric circles here, the Kalbuko uh, volcano here, and the circles here, so it was a very interesting result, so I know that the PI of this mission was quite happy about this. So what we did is we used uh, set, data of GNSS satellites located in Chile. Of course, it's not like in Japan, it's less dense, but we do what we can. And uh, then uh, you see the uh, uh, CIP, the points for the first eruption, the second, so several satellites. So this is the ionospheric response to the first eruption. You can see the eruption started here. And one of the main uh, differences was uh, <coughs> as compared to the earthquake response in the ionosphere, it's the, uh, the form, the waveform. So the earthquake, we most see like very strong sudden increases. Here is, it's more quiet and this quasi-periodic signal. And here you can see one, several wave trains, one, two, three, and sometimes two. So the first wave train occurs only 15 minutes after the eruption. Then it continues for some time. The second eruption, showed slightly different response because we only see one response, basically one wave train without, and it only occurs 40 minutes after the eruption. 
So uh, we explained this because this was the first eruption in 43 years. So most likely this the uh, volcano was plugged. So there was a, a mass that covered the uh, eruption, the volcano, the crater. And so when the eruption started, it first provoked this kind of shock wave that arrived first and then the second gravity wave arrived, acoustic gravity waves. Well, the second, there was just eruption continuing. So we only see the second part of the response. So then this is the um, TC in color. This is the volcano eruption. This is the volcano. So the, we start to see the signal here about 40 minutes after, because this is the second eruption. So we start to see the signal here, and it starts to propagate. It oscillates a lot, and then it propagates northward. And it lasts for some time after, after that, after this first observation. So next. Uh, it's uh, similar, so we observe these perturbations, but can we do something something else more? Can we go forward, I don't know, to, to try something else? More serious things. And uh, so if we see in the mesosphere these concentric circles, what if in the ionosphere what we observe is also a circle, is a part of circle? And if we take this approximation, then we can try to localize the position of the volcano from ionosphere. And this is what we do. So we take a point that will be a tracking point. So we, we know that this is the same the same perturbation that travels from a point source. This is a spherical wave and it also travels at the constant speed. So if we take this approximation we can take a very simple model as shown here. So this will be the source and then it propagates upward and we detect here. So then we Solve this system of equations. We we, we refine the um, location of the volcano from the first for the first eruption. It will be here. So each cross here shows the solution for a system of equation. So normally, if the model is correct, if if the wave is indeed spherical, very spherical, then we should have one single solution. However, it didn't work here. So we had to take groups of points. And so for each group of points, the solution comes as a cross here. So we can say that eruption was somewhere here. And for the second eruption, the location of points is more distributed, but most of them are here. And to be honest, we were not quite happy about these results first. And then with the look on the on other methods, there are solutions. So this is an infrasound observation. So they also can produce their solution about the location of eruption based on their measurements of waves arrived at infrasound stations. And if we like, if we zoom, it's, it will be 400 kilometers away from the eruption. So now we are happy. <laughs> methods work. So then um, another thing that we can do from our ionospheric measurements is not only to localize, but also to estimate the eruption onset. So usually the eruption onset is calculated from the nearest seismometers, but if we don't have seismometers within near uh, within 100 kilometers, it starts to be more difficult to estimate the onset of the eruption. So these are the results for the first eruption. This is from seismometer, this is from infrasound, and this is from ionosphere. We have a rather good agreement on the first eruption, but not so good agreement on the second eruption. So you see that seismometers and infrasound, they give uh, the same solutions, but for us, it's, uh, there is a huge delay. So we think that the delay is related to the fact that we actually we observed the perturbation quite late. And we don't know exactly at which altitude, and we also used uh, 30 seconds data and um, We'll try on new eruptions when, because now we have more and more high resolution data available and hopefully this uh, 
these results will be um, improved with uh, high, re high resolution data and um, we'll see in the future. So this will be the conclusions for my second part, so that we now use ionospheric measurements for detection of natural hazards, at least for some parts of that. And um, the next step will be development of near real-time methods that will help us to estimate the sources of natural hazards, especially this is important for earthquakes because we still, we yet, we have a dream, ionospheric dream to to understand the strengths of earthquake based on our ionospheric measurements. And uh, another contribution of the ionosphere in uh, natural hazards uh, um, is the, uh, the, the future, the, the mission proposal on the GLOW that, is, that will help to, uh, to observe the propagation of tsunamis from space. So this will be it. I thank you all for your attention and I thank all my co-authors because I have on the space part and the natural hazard part. So I thank them all for their contributions. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions comments in whatever language you wish. Um, comments? Okay, Barbara, here we go. Very nice uh, talk. I, I have uh, one question, I have two questions. One has to do with this uh, um, real-time determination. Can you, can you explain more, you know, how you know, what are the issues to yeah. be able to uh, uh, do this? Yeah. So I will come back to this figure. So this figure and actually even this video what we're doing is um, we need to filter the signal to see these features very clearly. And in the real time, this is not possible. So one of the things is, for instance, to, to have exactly these snapshots it will not be possible in real time unless we develop another method. So I have an idea to how to, to do this, but yet I need to, to work on that. So this is one of the issues. And uh, there will be other issues, again, related to the fact that the signal is not filtered. Because uh, when we use a filter is to, to see the signal clear. And the, the filter and it will change the amplitude and what happens if we, if we have unfiltered signal, so the amplitude will be smaller, unless for very strong earthquakes it will be okay. So this is one of the main issues that I see for now for the near real-time application. So what kind of filtering are you talking about? We usually we use the high band, not, well, band, band, band pass filter. So, I, I mean, we, we can use different, we can use a polynomial filter, which, whichever, fil well, yes, it will work high, like um, band pass filter. So we, we use the signal, because the raw signal, it will contain, um, yes, it will contain the, the, the trends due to the ionosphere, so when we use the filter, is uh, because we want to see the signal clear. However, if we have a near real time application, I mean, up the mode, this regime of real time, so this will be difficult to use the same kind of, the same kinds of method. So what I'm trying to say is, we want to go near real time. We need to either adapt our methods that are already developed on retrospectively, or to develop new ones who will be similar, who will work similarly than as our, our current method. For the for the long wavelength or the low frequency signals, can you use like predictions? Yes, if we can. Although uh, knowing the variability, the natural variability of the ionosphere, it it can be difficult. However, if we use like more um, advanced uh, technologies, including machine learning, so this is one of the ideas that I would like to try 
to to try to determine when when the increase starts, when it's anormal, or when it's okay, when it's just the background increase on the ionosphere due to some other uh, event. Okay, there is a question down here. Thank you, Elvira. It was a very, very nice talk indeed. I have two questions, one on the first part and one on the second part. Okay. So if we go back to the coronal mass ejection yes. with the little movie you showed. Yes. Uh, uh, something you did not comment on. Yes. And which I think I saw, but I'm not, I mean, is when you show the impact on the ionosphere, there were a series of, uh, of movies you were showing the... Ah, so okay, this was a geomagnetic storm. Yeah. If it was a movie. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, Where was it? Yes, this. No? Yes, 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 yes. exactly. Well, the one where we saw several coronal mass ejections, one after the other. Oh, maybe that was the one. In any case, in one of the movies, mm -hmm. my, that's my main question, in the, in the tech, uh, when the event occurs, it might be in this one, Obviously, we expect a signature on the day side, but there is sometimes a signature on the night side, and that is something I don't fully understand. So, do, do you have an explanation for this? I, I if you are talking about this video, is this this one or it was another one? Yeah, that's, that's on the night side. You can yes. still see some signature. Yes, so it, it's how, quite how normal in the ionosphere. Because this is, not, this is, this is a geomagnetic storm. This is not so. When a solar flare occurs, we only see the uh, the reaction on the day side. When geomagnetic st storm occurs, it can be w w whenever, wh wherever. And so, what so is causing the, uh, the okay. perturbation in the ionosphere in that case? Okay, so uh, the main drivers, the main causes of changes in the ionosphere, there are three main. So this will be changes in the electrodynamics. This often happens on the day and night side, and they are opposite directed. So if, if we see an increase on the day side, on the night side, there will be decrease. It often happens this way, except for the post-sunset sector, just after the terminator. And the other is the thermosphere that can impact the, the ionosphere, or there is the composition. So the change of atoms and molecules that comes from high latitude regions. So one of these impacts should play a role. Which one, when, and how? This is our task to do. Okay. So. In that's, the that, okay. That, that's fine. The the, uh, <laughs> the 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 other question about the second one is about the volcanic uh, yes. volcanic uh, uh, eruption. One thing that I find intriguing is that the signals you see is basic. Looks very much like a modulation of a given frequency. Yes. So what, what is driving the frequency that you see? Is this the filtering or is yes. this the volcanic or is it the, I mean, what, what's the reason for the stability of the frequency? It should be, it should be the gravity waves that generate this way, this kind of the quasi period. Whenever we see these this waveforms, this is a fault of, uh, of gravity waves. Acoustic gravity waves. So this is a filtered signal. Again, so coming back to filtering, we use filter all the time because we want to see this, uh, the beauty in the signal, right? So if we see the raw signal, I, I have them, but not in this presentation. So we will see these variations, but it will be smaller because we will see the huge uh, trend. But we, yet we will see these variations. So filtering, when we apply it, it just extracts signal and it Clearly, it's because of the gravity waves. And by the way, gravity waves, they, they have this waveform in the, in the ionosphere. And by the way, it's, it's uh, yet, if we want to model this, so I think it was the work of Eric Calais. So they modeled the acoustic part that they don't, they don't do the gravity waves so far. So it's, this is one of the open questions, the waveform as well. So we think it's the gravity wave because as, an exp as experts, we know that this monochromatic shape is, is gravity waves. Okay. A question. 
uh, you uh, showed us that you have a threshold. Yes. 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 Some kind of relationship for uh, high magnitude. Uh, you showed us afterwards the example of Kalbuko eruption with uh, volcanic explosivity index four. Would that be your threshold for volcanic eruption? No. And second question, according to your available data set, do you observe some kind similar comparable proportional relationship between VI and uh, your, the amplitude of your signal? Yes, so yes indeed. Uh, so the threshold for volcanoes will be the V2. So this is the lowest that we observed in the ionosphere. And uh, indeed, it's, it will be the same for, for the eruptions. So the larger the eruption, the stronger is the response. But the thing is that we have also to take into account the background ionospheric. So the contribution of the waves that arrive from below will, be, will scale, yes. Okay, I, we have to use a microphone because we are registered, that's why. Okay, so Giovanni, hop, hop, hop. Thanks, Alvira. Um, I have just a question about uh, uh, the two localization of um, the... Eruption. Eruptions. And I was wondering if it's the second case in which the localization is a little bit, you know, Forward Drifted, from the yes. from the from the epicentral yes. position. Uh, if there is, uh, if if you explored the um, the structure of the wind that day, the specific day, yeah, uh, because yeah. you know wind can introduce a uh, large variation in gravity wave propagation, and it's interesting that you found this similar displacement also for infrasound. Okay, so uh, oh god, okay then. Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, the thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, there were infrarouge um, photographs from space that showed that, indeed, I think due to the winds, but the plume from the second eruption, it drifted north-eastward. And I, this also made me personally happy for my results because we actually we see where the plume went because this is the source that produces the... It produces the perturbations as we think. So indeed, um, if we look, I, I don't have the photograph, but actually the uh, the plume was was located, was really shifted towards northeastward from the eruption. Okay, M maybe I have one question. Um, do you think that big fires, like the Australian one, could perturb the ionosphere? I would say no, but I would probably check, just in case. They perturb the stratosphere, that's for sure. Yeah, well, but then if, if, the, if they modify the stratosphere, they will probably eventually arrive to an ionosphere, because the stratospheric warmings, they do produce changes in the ionosphere. Okay. Well, at least we tried um, sleeps, uh, measure sleeps, and we didn't find a reaction in the ionosphere. Okay, do we have other questions, comments? If not, I remind you that there is a buffet in Mediatek and we would like to thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. <laughs>